So without further ado, let's, uh, let's, uh, let me just, uh, I, Will's a great friend of MRES and of myself and, and some of us on the, on the, the Zoom meeting tonight. Will has had an amazing career in education and environmental leadership and innovation. I mean, he's done so many unique things in, in entrepreneur. And then that, that other little thing that he got involved in called exploration. And with some of the amazing trips that he made with uh, his dogs and everything, it's just, uh, I'm just really honored to have him here tonight to, to share his information with us. So, Will, welcome, and um, thank you so much for being part of this. Yeah, well, thanks, Doug. And, um, Doug, thank you for everything. You were, you were in on this before I was, before I got started. We they went back about 18 years, and, you know, you know, Doug has done such a great work for all of us. You're volunteer. 2,000 hours plus a year, which, you know, add that up and so much time that is. And uh, you're a great friend of all of us here. And, and and thanks for the invite to speak. I feel I'm talking to, you know, a family here because a lot of us have worked over the years and we've seen the, you know, we were participating in making the dream of clean energy come true in the state. And and a lot, a lot of you here have We've been responsible for the, this great economy that we have that's really flourishing and uh, it's so prevalent right now. We're into electric cars and everything like this. And it, was, it wasn't that way 18 years ago. You know, we, none of this existed and people were not aware of climate at that time. And uh, so we, you know, with Doug and, you know, it, it was a really a family effort here to bring the state where we're at. And, the presentation I want to do tonight is about legacy. I, I call it the life of legacy. It's really about my my story, but uh, but I want to ask the question uh, to everyone here: what is what is your what is your legacy? What is your personal legacy? I mean, over and beyond, we have a family legacy. We have a family. We have blood relations in that. But um, you know, what is it? What's your life about? What do you want to leave behind? Uh, you know, how do you how do you approach that? And because uh, we, we all have this individual legacy and it's all important that we fulfill what is very important to us and we leave behind. And it, it's not like, uh, for me, it's not like leaving a, a, a name behind so people always remember your name, which is kind of nonsense. Um, I look at the Wellstone legacy as an example. I mean, if you're over, if you're over 40, everybody knows who Wellstone is, but people that are in their teens and 20s you know, may, may have heard about Wellstone somewhere else, but but Wellstone's legacy is living on and on and on. Wellstone Center, everything that he's done, he affected so many people and so many people that aren't even aware of who he was and whatever. And that's an example of what a legacy is. It's something that carries, it's part of being a spirit of something that's really good and uh, a spirit of why we're here on this planet. And it carries on uh, after we leave, or, or or we we're you know we're part of it as we're we're living, of course. But um, I want to go over my personal legacy, which was uh, you know I was re really fortunate in my life. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. For, for one, one one was the uh, this is where it all started to me. I mean, this was my home in Richfield. Uh, we had ten kids in the family one bathroom, and uh, I'm product of the American dream. My dad fought in a Pacific and came back. He was married, Margaret, my wonderful mother, and uh, fortunately su survived the war. He came back, and they together with my mom they raised ten kids. But my dad was an entrepreneur, and um, he he raised the kids on his own ideas. He had his own company, and a lot of the, a lot of at least his friends all had their individual their companies, uh, kind of the free enterprise system. So. I was raised in a household where, first of all, my parents had a great relation, lots of love. Um, on the top floor there, six boys in one room. That was called the dormitory. Four girls in one bedroom downstairs. And the parents, of course, had one bedroom to themselves. So it was it was a family, a, an incredible family. You know, we got along pretty well considering. But my, my parents, we were raised in such a way that we were given pretty much total freedom to do whatever we wanted to do, which was really quite rare at that time. And um, I was able to follow really what my dream was. And as a child, 
uh, one of the things that was real important to me was uh, mountain climbing. And uh, this was back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, there wasn't any, um, you couldn't even buy a, a, a rope. <laughs> there wasn't such a thing as mountain climbing in Minnesota in the 60s. In fact, I climbed on the North Shore, uh, Taylor's Falls. I never saw another climber until the early 70s. Uh, but I checked the book out of the library, uh, bought a hemp rope out of the hardware store and uh, recruited a couple of good friends and we started climbing. Uh, on the North Shore of Taylor's Falls, and you know, we learned learned the hard way. This is when I was 16 years old. Finally, got to the uh, Canadian Rockies. A friend of mine was 17. He had a car license and an old car, so we got out to the Canadian Rockies. There, we managed to buy a good rope, and we got in with good people. But this was a very just the very beginning of it. Uh, but but uh, everything I did like this, I'm self-taught on pretty much everything I did. So climbing was a big thing. I, my my goal was really major expeditions. I wanted to get up to higher elevations, way into the wilderness where you had to travel for days to make a base camp and then many camps to get up high, rather than rock climbing. Rock climbing was important to me. Uh, it was sort of like, you wanna learn a culture to study a country, you really have to have the language. And the rock climbing was a language. You had to have that skill in order to get to the higher ice climbing where I was destined to. And, um, and it was also, I had like any young kid, you know, teenager, I had plenty of energy. And, uh, but you know, like, like my philosophy of education all along is really very simple. It's first just to bring, simply bring the curiosity out of your student. And once that younger person has the curiosity, you add content and content is, you know, a young person will really absorb content if they're, they're, they have the curiosity. And I had this curiosity and I followed through with it. By the time I was 18, I was doing, uh, starting to do lead wall climbing. And uh, this was where uh, I separated a little bit from my peers. I, I never thought of myself any better than anyone else. I was a slow learner, dyslexic. I came from that situation, which was in you know, the prize spot in the classroom. Uh, but I learned real quickly uh, when I was a teenager to be at that very edge where it was really scary, where you thought you were gonna die and so forth. But I learned to be at my very best at that edge where you really had to concentrate and be in that present. At a time when you're you'd be freaking out and panicking, uh, I was able to really learn that in climbing. And um, I carried through with that too, but being in that presence, being in that present moment uh, was a moment, I, something I wanted to do more and more of. And in order to do that, I needed more skills because I wanted to be a better climber. I wanted to excel. And I ended up, you know, by the time I was 20, I climbed mountains in the Peruvian Andes. I joined an expedition. It wasn't my expedition, but it was, I got in with some really great climbers of the day at that time. Uh, we did uh, three first ascents over 20,000 feet. And, uh, and that was that was an incredible thing for me. Uh, all this was all all along. Uh, I was going to school, and uh, my goal when I was when I was younger, uh, I was born with a vocation to be a, a teacher. I didn't necessarily see myself as a classroom teacher. Class school was tough on me. I I, I, I like the social part of uh, of of school. I I had you know I was good socially, so that was kind of my edge, and I was good athletically. But really, I I, I saw the importance early on that uh, since I wanted to be a teacher, I really needed to be a certified teacher. In other words, I had a, I needed a degree, I needed a master's degree, and I needed to have three three years of experience I felt in the classroom. So all during this era, uh, when I was really younger, when I did these incredible expeditions, I was, you know, I was doing my schooling. And actually I always, I left on expeditions every summer. They used to say it kept my sanity from school. I just took off on these long 90, you know, 90 day expeditions. But all along, I, I had this goal of, of being a teacher. And uh, and so in the younger days, I was working on this education. But at the same time, I was also took up kayaking. Uh, I was always inspired. I got my inspiration by the photographs in the National Geographic magazines, because those gave me the images with which I wrapped my dreams around. And in the National Geographic, I, I, I learned about a kayak expedition on the Yukon River, which really gave me this idea of kayaking. And no one else climbed or kayaked at that time. And kayaks for me were uh, really the best because you could travel in white water like this, whereas a canoe wouldn't really, really wouldn't work at all. And uh, like when you're 300 miles out like this, you could tip over and lose your boat in the wilderness. You know, that 
pretty much it. <laughs> uh, so kayaking is what I really aspire to, and, and that gave me the avenue to travel north. So when I was 19, I did a 3,000-mile kayak trip leaving in Jasper, Alberta, northern, uh, nor northern uh, um, uh, in the southern Rockies, so southern Canada. And we left uh, uh, right in Banff for Jasper, Alberta. And my friend I recruited, I, I used to wrestle with him, Ole Olson. So we, we did this 3,000-mile ki kayak trip, which was incredible. We got to the Arctic Ocean. And we, had, we had literally had to portage over the Rocky Mountains, the Richardson Range, huge range of mountains, in order to get across to the other side, which was Alaska. Uh, then we paddled south through Alaska to the Yukon. Because our goal here was to get out so we could hitchhike and get back to school in time. And that was, uh, this was really where I came of age. And and um, and all through my life, I wanted to live in the wilderness. So after that expedition, when I was 19, um, I bought land, I traveled in Ely, I went up North Shore, looked all over, but I had this intention and people said there was no land. I went to fires, you know, resorts, looking all over the place, I ended up in Ely, but the short story, long story short is I found perfect piece of property, it was three miles from nearest road, exactly what I was looking for, no road, and, and I had to cross a long lake and cross over. And it was there that I bought, you know, built, started building my home uh, when I was at a young age. I, I live in this a cabin actually still today. And uh, this is still, I was in my schooling age at this time. Was, and uh, I, was, I, I was undergraduate and I was teaching. And then um, when I was 25, I had my degrees. Um, I loved the city. I mean, I had lots of friends here, but I, get, I said goodbye for, uh, to the city. I mean, I, I wasn't going to come down here to, to make my living anymore. I had my qualifications, so I moved to the wilderness. And the challenge when you're isolated, especially as a kid that's 25, is, you know, first of all, how are you going to get things work done, and 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 how are you going to meet people and so forth. So, uh, you know, it was really with a lot of help from my friends because when you're in remote area, you don't have a bobcat or a machine that's going to pick up your logs and move it. You know, I I um, had a lot of friends and. Um, we cleared land. My goal then, when I, in, in 1970, was to be self-sufficient. Uh, Self-reliance was a most important value of me. I think I was being, maybe it's generation I came from. Self-reliance, me was everything. Uh, I, you know, I never, want, I worked in, in the factories, wherever drove cabs, wherever it took to get through school. But uh, I had no intention of working for the man at all. I wanted to do my own thing, and uh, and part of that was to raise my own food. And this is 50, uh, 54 years ago. And uh, so we cleared land. It was about a three-year project by hand. Uh, but then within about three years, I, you know, we were producing gardens. I had a root cellar. Um, I, was, I lived on 12,000 a year for 12 years, 2,000 a year for 12 years. And uh, what really changed my life was, um, you know, how do I make a living? Uh, I made, I started a dog sledding and skiing school in the early 70s. And that's what got me into dogs. I'd never been on a dog team before, but I felt the, the way to do it, I worked at Outward Bound two winters. Uh, dog, nobody ever used dogs. And Outward Bound was a, was a paradigm at that time. It introduced me to outdoor education. And I really found my niche. I actually, for the first time, I, I met peers, a lot, of, a lot of people from out West, men and women, because women didn't do any of this at, the, at, at Minnesota, at least. And Outward Bound really opened up the avenues. But I lasted there two years because I, I had my own ideas. I thought it should be done with dogs rather than people, you know, carrying 70, 80 pound packs. So I formed a school called Lynx Track. It was tough to get it going, but within about two, three years, uh, I had an amazing number of courses. I did day terms, youth at risk. I did the first wilderness inquiry um, accessibility programs where I took people, you know, 50, 60 miles into the wilderness that couldn't, you know, that were in wheelchairs. Uh, so I was able to develop my own programs, and uh, but then, you know, I I did that uh, I I did that for about eight years. 1980 was was kind of the end of the tour. I was very successful. I could have done it for the rest of my life, uh, but I just was not reaching the numbers of people that I made. I mean, our, our courses reached me about 80 people, but I just had a bigger vision for myself in education and that. So I gave my school away to Paul Sturkey, who is not, is now um, Wintergreen. And then I launched into major expeditions at that time, early 80s. And that, that, and that eventually led me to uh, the North Pole, uh, 1986. That's when I first surfaced you know, nationally on uh, media. But it wasn't you know, like, 
I had been doing this for about 20 years before I made the front page here on this, but the, the, um, Antarctica, the North Pole gave me more opportunities. And it was within the, it was on the ice in 86. This is the Arctic Ocean, which again, this whole area is, does climate change. You can't do the, you can't do the North Pole at all from land. That's the thing of his, historical. And, uh, but in that, this rugged country like this, on the way to the pole in 86, I ran into this Frenchman by the name of John Louis Etienne. And, uh, and it was, that was the beginning of the Antarctica expedition. He was soloing. Uh, I was leading this team of, of eight people. And we literally ran into each other, you know, 200 miles out in an area the size of the United States, moving ice. I mean, you couldn't see any more than a quarter of a mile. Uh, but, you know, like energy attracts. I don't know how we met, but at that point in his tent, we put together the Trans-Antarctica Expedition. Uh, which was 1990, and, and there was a treat, an Antarctic Treaty Review in 1990 that was going to open up Antarctica for mineral exploration, which was the beginning of the end. There was 26 treaty nations. In order to change that, we had to reverse all 26 nations. They all had to reverse their opinion in order to stop this. So that was what we decided to do, is we formed this huge expedition, international team of six people from uh, six countries, draw world attention to Antarctica and the need to reverse it. Uh, and it was a you know a huge goal, but that's what we decided to do. We shook hands and there was no guarantee at that time in 86, we'd even make the pole. We were still 250 miles out, but we made it. And then we organized Trans Antarctica. And this was, we crossed the uh, Arctic, we crossed the, you know, 4,000 miles across uh, Antarctica at that time. And I, read, I led this international team of uh, six team members, to, um, on the left here is, is uh, Jeff Summers from uh, Great Britain. He he uh, he, he, he uh, worked for the British Antarctic Survey. Chin Daho, uh, uh, world-renowned scientist, uh, glaciologist, won the actual Nobel Peace Prize in 08. Uh, Kezo Fernanda from Japan. John Wee Etienne, French physician, who was my partner. Je uh, Victor Boyarsky, uh, another glaciologist from the Soviet Union at this time, and myself along with 30 dogs that we specially bred. Um, it was logistically a really complicated expedition. Uh, our joint venture with the Soviet Union, this is during the Cold War, we managed to get the Soviets to fly this plane. We landed actually in the International Airport at St. Paul. First time ever a Soviet plane ever entered the airspace of the United States. I mean, that putting this expedition together was, and we raised $8 million on it. I mean, I was living on $2,000 a month like three years before this. And uh, and then we did this incredible trip of, I don't know, you know, we we're all baffled how we actually survived this, but, but we realized that we were really part of history. Uh, nobody was, you know, everyone, we had full cooperation around the world on this expedition. Uh, it was totally unknown. I mean, over this mountain range, totally unknown. Nobody had ever crossed this area in the wintertime. And we left in the winter. No one had ever conceived of doing a trip this long. But we did this to really, uh, something that was really a stunning, something that really drew world attention, which it did. And we traveled as always uh, by, by dog team, uh, six do uh, uh, three dog teams, six people, 30 dogs, you know, lots of danger, crevasses. Uh, this is on the uh, South Pole elevation and then we crossed uh, Daho did uh, a sampling of a traverse every every uh, 40 kilometers he did a you know dig a pit like this did a full traverse sampling of snow which was in his dedication was incredible I mean in, in addition to surviving and everything else uh, he did this full uh, scientific program along the way and this is the end of the expedition here John Lee and I are bracing I mean it's just incredible for John Lee but we were responsible for this, everything. I mean, this was a dangerous trip. And uh, when you're leading it all, everybody goes through the same hardships at night, but the rest of the people sleep at night, but you're responsible for everything here. But here at the end of the, the trip, it was the greatest moment of my life here. John Lee and I, we, we took the huge risk and we were able to do this, but then, okay, we drew the attention. The next step was the, was the political side. And then, so the next year, half a year, we went around the, and we met world leaders. As I mentioned, we had to get, it was like a poker game. We had to get every world, we had every country, the 26 countries, to reverse their opinion. We landed in Australia with the, with the Russian ship. The prime minister was the first to sign to reverse it. And that collapsed the whole 
banned to begin with. It's to put it in a total chaos because the, to open it up for mining, they needed to hold 26 consensus. But in order to cinch the deal, we need the other 25 countries. So President Mitran came on board. Uh, he signed. We got his. And then we met the Prime Minister of Japan. And uh, since we were getting momentum, they signed. And then the, uh, and, and we went to the, this is at the Kremlin and the Soviet Union during the Gorbachev area. So we met the top people of the government there and they signed on board. And then we went to, the, this is the president of China. Um, they signed on board, they committed, they had a token uh, presence in science um, in Antarctica, but the president here committed to doing uh, major science for climate in Antarctica and today, China does more science than the National Science Foundation. That was kind of the basis of this. And then in the end, we met President Bush, who was a real diplomat, a real gentleman. He was surrounded by Sununu, who was an uh, anti-environmentalist chief of staff. And he kept the president in the, in the dark about all anything environment. So when it came to the vote, the only country that uh, abstained was President Bush. And uh, which again, Bush was, didn't even realize it. This is back when diplomacy was important for a president. So the nations under a huge effort reconvened the next year. And again, the president didn't know he, he abstained again under Sununu. So Kathy Namal was our business manager. Our, our, we had three part, partnership between John Lee, Mai and myself. Uh, Kathy Namal managed Garrison Keeler his early days. and catapult him into in, in 1985 garrison keeler was on the cover of newsweek and time magazine at the same time uh, the younger people don't remember that but that that made keeler and, and he, kathy was the person behind the scenes there and jim brenberg introduced me to kathy and um, in 86 i got a down payment for north of the pole and i gave her the down payment to get her on board but she was an excellent writer and i both of us wrote a, a letter to president bush we got the letter in through Dave Durenberg, and uh, it really touched the president. It changed his mind. And then on July 4th, 1991, at Mount Rushmore, uh, he signed. And um, the Antarctica then was set aside. The treaty re will be reviewed again in about another 25 years. But And there is about 47, 48 treaty members now. But if they want to open it up for mi mining, they have to have a full consensus, which is not likely. And this is the reason why policy is so important because we did a lot of policy like this in renewable energy, which I'll talk about later. But once we got the policy in 07, 08, Republicans have been trying to change that ever since, but policy you can't change like at a whim when if someone's just elected. You have, you've got to have a, a super majority or a full majority to do that. And I went on to work in uh, Washington. I testified a number of uh, congressional hearings. This launched my whole career nationally and internationally. And um, this was talking about climate in 1991, about the ocean currents of the Arctic Ocean, which now aren't even there anymore. I mean, uh, it was pretty much deaf years in 91. Uh, Bob Dole here, President Durenberg. Um, this is uh, Vice President uh, Quayle, who's a really good guy. This is at National Geographic. Uh, this is Gil Grosvenor, uh, President. His grandfather was uh, Graham Bell, who started the National Geographic. Uh, so we got, you know, and then this is the King of Saudi Arabia <laughs> in 1992. They, they were, uh, they provided a couple of scientists in Antarctica. So we, I mean, the Saudis were powerful because they have money, uh, but we got them involved in, in, in the science. And uh, this is, uh, as an educator, I introduced them to the internet. Uh, I mean, this whole thing, I, I developed a huge program uh, educational program at that time around the internet, when, right when the internet was coming on board. Uh, uh, I represented the National Science Foundation and was in Nigeria from the, uh, the African Convention here. I was, I was talking about climate change here in 92. They got it because their climate change was real. Their, the desert was already taken over, over their land. And then we did, um, in the early 90s, it was an incredible time uh, because the internet was brand new. People didn't even know what the internet was. But this was historical because this is in the Northwest Territories. And I went up to the territories, I met with all the all the departments there and the person in transportation or uh, uh, it was technology at that time, didn't know what the internet was. And 
he thought I was a salesman trying to sell him something. He said, what are you all about here? And I, no, and he got it. And then uh, as a result, we connected all the, all the schools in Nunavut. This is in 92, 93. We connected all the schools together. This is the first time the schools were connected. And then we were doing this major trip across the Arctic Ocean in 95. So we built up the technology, the teachers. We did this all at Hamlin. At that time, I founded the Global Center for Environmental Education. This was all done at Hamlin University around, around at this time. And then in 95, we crossed the Arctic Ocean. And at that time, we had, we did the, the first, uh, this, this was the first uh, picture, you know, from the North Pole. It, it took us almost two weeks to get this out. We, just a little bit of snippets at a time. It was really a, a nightmare sending it up. And um, but the at that time in '95, the Arctic Ocean now was starting to open up. It was really dangerous. Uh, the, the first time we had more open water in '95 in one day than we did the whole expedition in nine years before in '86 in 54 days. And this was something I never thought I'd ever see here. And I I predicted this because we had to get off the ice. Uh, and this was in July. I knew that the ice would be breaking, so we flew the dogs out and flew the canoes in. But at that time, I never thought I'd be canoeing. And uh, you know, this was part of my eyewitness account here that I did. And then you know, we're all familiar with a lot of this, but it was this eyewitness account that Doug and so many of us, uh, we all worked together in uh, 04, 05, 06, and 07 and 08 to, to, uh, in Minnesota to get this uh, legislation. It was the renewable electricity standard, 30% renewables by 2020, and everybody was kicking and screaming and couldn't do it. Uh, but we, you know, we did, we talked to thousands of uh, over a couple hundred churches, actually, uh, mainly uh, uh, we were mostly in the conservative areas, but it was, you know, stories like this and Jay Drake and all these, all these stories. But this was the, this is my call to action in 2002. This is the Larson Ice Shelf. It, to get an idea here, it's about 100, this open ocean, 100 miles from here to the mountains. It took us 16 days to cross this. So I, I was intimately aware of the, the Larson Ice Shelf. And then in uh, uh, March, uh, February and March of 2002, and March 5th, it totally, this is it, this whole huge thing just totally collapsed. And, um, and when this happened, 2002 and March 7th, I read the, I read the paper, Minneapolis Tribune, I, after nearly two weeks later, it was like page 14, no one paid any attention to it. When I read the article, it was, it was really my, that's when I committed myself on the spot that I would have to work my life now in climate. And um, that was my wake up call. So this is in March. And then that uh, November of 2002, then I moved to the city, bought a houseboat on the Mississippi River, set up bases. And then then we started you know, doing what a lot of us did. We, 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 did, we came together, uh, a couple of nonprofits, we, got the churches involved. Um, we started pounding away and got bigger. We got the media behind us and, um, and it, all, it was all, and I started, uh, I tried to find a, this is our first board meeting with climate generation. It was back then there was a little secret bump. I tried to get a, a, a picture without the beer bottles. Nicole was all over with me, but this is our first uh, meeting um, up in Ely. But, you know, so what I did is I eventually, I, I, I spent three or four years working, you know, with everyone uh, building up the movement. And then finally in 05, when I got Nicole, got a small grant, which enabled me to call, hire Nicole. So in 05, we really incorporated. And then I had a board of, uh, board of directors and I, uh, you're getting, you get more more and more organization. That's when was the Seeger, uh, was Seeger Foundation at that time. And then, you know, I came down to the city and I, no one, no one was aware of this at all. Fresh Energy was aware of, uh, you know, they were in it since the 90s, but no one saw it from the climate perspective of what, what really was happening. So a lot of times when you're faced with something that you just can't, you wonder, how do I get going on this? How do I start? Are you looking for a job or whatever? You always look at, I always look at where am I, where am I best at? What do I do best? And I, where my best is I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. I work with kids. I've done that all my life. So that's first thing I did was start teaching the kids in the school and my goal was to, to build up the teacher institutes and uh, to get the teachers organized to get the grant money and to get client climate in the science curriculum 
And then actually we did that and during a Republican, we got, got it despite the Republicans. I don't know how we did it, but we got the grants from the state uh, and we got the science curriculum. I didn't write the curriculum, of course, the, the teachers wrote the curriculum. And then we got the energy in the curriculum next and then and then other states start moving. And then we, then we worked on a national level to get climate in the science standards. So like right now there's like 35 states that have to teach it that's in the standards. So that's the ultimate goal is get in the curriculum. And the goal here for me, I'm always a very long range thinker is we have to make sure that our kids are, are educated. So we don't have a, a, a generation like ours, uh, the older generation, the boomers and the ones directly below that are that have this denial stuff that is so unbelievably crazy and embarrassing, but it's real that we need a we need an educated youth that you can't pull the wool over their eyes with science. And that was really, really how I looked at it. And uh, and as you know, and uh, then you know, here we got uh, we did our working with young kids. Um, we then we worked in the in 07, 08, uh, we worked, we, we had to get more ground nationally now, and we start working up in the expedition. We did an expedition in 07 around Baffin Island. We traveled uh, with Inuit hunters around Baffin Island. What we wanted to do is put a cultural face on climate change rather than the science. We wanted to do interviews with the elders, both men and women, and, and meet with the kids and get the kids involved in in this by getting them connected. So we worked, oops, works there, uh, Inuit schools and uh, uh, National Geographic. I mean, we, it was a huge media event. He, you know, basically my expeditions all through my life have been a, a means to an end. They all have been platforms to draw attention to the environment and educational projects. You know, obviously what looking back here, it's it, it's a uh, you know climate, but before the climate, it might have been the National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. It, it was about uh, transboundary pollution and all this, uh, but but bringing in uh, the, the we involved the whole culture, but the culture then with the media, National Geographic, that went national with us. So getting a cultural perspective was really uh, simply incredible. I mean, they got it. They were they knew about climate change before we even started talking about it. They had a huge convention. All the elders got together, Cambridge Bay in 02, to talk about climate. And uh, so we did we did that expedition. I also recruited, this is uh, Richard Branson. He was on an expedition. Uh, he, Richard's a really wonderful guy. He uh, entrepreneurial guy. He doesn't donate to nonprofits. It's good to see him on his knees here, <laughs> teaching him how to put up a tent. But he was a great guy. But he he also gave us a lot of coverage. And his son uh, joined us on another expedition that we did the next year. Uh, but then a lot of you are, are familiar with what we, we did here. This is congregation. I think this was in, it was St. It might have been St. Cloud, but back in uh, 06, 7, 8, 9, 10, you know, we were we were drawing sometimes 800 to 1,000 people. And uh, Doug would be in the background with the exhibits and we have many things going on, but it was a great time. And we, we had the people admit it. And then this is up in Alaska. Now, I have the advantage over most environmentalists and with my adventure and living in the woods and so forth, I can communicate really well to rural areas. And this is Alaska where environmentalists couldn't go up there. I mean, they, but here I, and we I met, was in did Juno Anchorage and this is Fairbanks and uh, you know this is this is close to the Prudhoe Bay but they got it because you know I talked about being self sufficient about what Alaska is supposed to be you know all the rednecks up there yelling and screaming about everything but they're all about being self sufficient and you know what do you mean self sufficient you're relying on oil it's all about wind and solar and they really got that message and um, and it was just remarkable you know you can you can tell the expression that was uh, this is a uh, uh, Missoula uh, uh, we went to Montana we, we spoke to Missoula Helena uh, we, we spoke in Bismarck I mean the coal country it went right in there we, we had a, we put in a thousand people in Bismarck that one night and I had people saying we, we agree to disagree I mean there was respect between us where we could actually talk 
openly within the within the groups and now uh, getting that message uh, getting getting into that conservative audience and i'm very unfortunately today i i'm just pretty tired of this politics and and the progressive people i, I think are really become victims in that they we've demonized the rural area because trump or something so we look at everybody as being stupid or in the rural areas we we've lost our communication with the rural areas which is I think it's just a really hard time for me uh, that we even are people are even thinking that way because these are the rural people these are the people that really count because why are they voting for Trump or whatever uh, I mean they don't they certainly don't I don't think most of these people don't hold his his morals um, but but when you're looking at another uh, progressive audience that's demonizing you and calling you idiots and that you know uh, it's all about communication and and uh, I. I know this is all can be changed. I don't, it's not the end of the road because I, I have trust in the rural area. Uh, I, I think the liberals have to be a little bit more open, I think, to things. But but it, but it's a, a statement of where we're at politically is what we're for, forgetting about is tolerance, basic tolerance, basic values, basic characters, and living not just an example, but being an example to yourself and your thoughts. And, uh, you know, this is where when we're confused about everything, I, you know, this is where we got to go. But the work that we did, you know, back then, communicating with it was real important. I think this is in Wilmer. We got uh, the governor was a, was a freshman congressman at that time. And uh, he was great. He was, he was a great supporter. So we've, we've had some really good governors, Walls and, and, and Dayton. Um, Helena gave us more than we asked for, by the way, you know, 07, 08. He was great. And uh, and then we did, I think this this was in 07. I, uh, some of you were there. This is very historical. Both the House and the Senate met first time since the 70s around the next generation energy, next generation energy bill. The renewable electricity standards were part of this, but this is when we presented, we had, we had the uh, heads of all the, uh, from the Jewish congregations, the Catholics, uh, uh, the Lutherans, uh, it was an incredible list of presentations. And we, we got 94, 95% of the vote for that bill at that time. And, uh, and it was really remarkable. Uh, and it, it was a job uh, well done and, and uh, something that the state has really benefited from. But for myself, policy is really very important. And then um, I'm gonna watch your time here. Um, organize the youth. The youth were very important. I mean, youth are at, at, in the kindergarten level. Uh, you know, the sixth graders are now in their 20s or 26 that we start teaching. You know, all those kids where I'm showing the globe to, you know, they're, they're out there working. A lot of them are probably working in clean energy jobs and benefiting from this uh, incredible job market that we're in. But we started the youth movement in Minnesota first. Um, and then uh, that movement grew. We, we built that into uh, national, and now the youth movement is really a force, a real, real force to reckon with, reckon it, reckon with uh, politically. And uh, I'm hoping the youth group. Uh, this is a really tough uh, political scene here, but I'm just hoping that the 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 youth, the young people, can really get get focused here on the climate. That we can't tolerate the deniers anymore. Uh, we really have to vote for the people that are going to stand for your future. And I think this election, we, I think that the, the youth gave a really good signal. The reason we got the majority this year, by the way, a slim majority by just one person, one seat, is because the youth really, really came to bat for everybody this, this last election here in Minnesota. So a real power horse. And then we did, we, I did an expedition with the youth in 08, because we, we needed the youth to be more involved. And these were, these were uh, extreme athletes. I mean, they're uh, remarkable. Uh, international, I mean, the, some of the top uh, polar guy, uh, kiters here, dog sledders, uh, dog racers. Uh, we did this remarkable expedition together uh, in Ellesmere Island, which, which we got global attention to it, but it really got, helped us. What it did for the younger people, it gave them uh, their heroes of their own age group. These age group being like 24 here. And uh, we, we did this remarkable expedition. And, and then we moved the youth into the um, um, the the um, climate conferences. This this was COP 20, 2009 in Copenhagen, and we moved it 
you know, in, into the national level. And then uh, the youth really, really played a pivotal role for us in the early days. This is in 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right up through there, because the, the, the top, the real organizers of the youth, uh, we cultivated, of course, and cultivating means you don't tell youth do this and that. You you give give them potential opportunities. They make their own choices. But but all these young people here are just politically really savvy. They're tolerant. When they're when they're speaking uh, with a Republican senator that we need in their office, they're polite. They're listening. Uh, when when the Republican senator repeat something, a talking point from Fox Network, they, that's an opportunity. They politely correct them and show them, no, it's not that. But we, in this case, we brought these 12 organizers. Mark was waffling a little bit back in, I think it was 2012. It was about the uh, North Dakota kept wanting to use our utility lines to get their coal into Minnesota. We made the rule, uh, no, no carbon means you can't bring carbon through our through our our power lines. But Mark was under pressure, waffling. We brought the younger people in. We had like 20 minutes with Paul, and they were just so articulate. They talked about their families, their future. Mark got so involved in it. He canceled his all, all his appointments that morning, and we sat around and talked for two and a half hours. And then, uh, and later we signed the document. And this this is when the youth movement was really growing here. Uh, this was really, for me, I'm up in the audience now watching the youth movement. This is like, for me, total. To me, mission accomplished is when I create something, I can leave quietly the back door and no one knows any involvement that I had in it. It's not important. This is what, you know, this is really what legacy, like a well-stone legacy. And here's the, you know, Mark signing the document. And uh, and then we know all, everybody in the background there, the people that have, we've all worked together uh, we recognize all everybody there, Michael Noble, everyone that Melissa here, Hartman, and uh, so many good friends, you know, that, that have worked together. If you're down, you know, you you gotta you gotta work to, as a group, as as one person, you can get down, but work around with like-minded and positive people. And then for the climate, this was kind of this was a big rally that happened. Uh, it was Trump when Trump just got elected? They had a huge rally around science was real. <laughs> This is around climate, but this was to me a success story because here I'm at the state capitol. I'm not. I'm not speaking. I have. I'm not have anything to do with it. But this was my vision of of what I wanted to do with the movement was to create this thing, and for my vision for the movement was exactly where we're at today. I mean, I'm I'm off on another direction right now, and uh, and that's that's the direction. The legacy of my life has always been uh, the Seeger Center, which I want to spend my last. I'm still on time to uh, a dog, so we're doing fine. My goal was to uh, build a center in the wilderness and to draw eventually world leaders, world national and international leaders, uh, of higher level leaders and policymakers. Because I felt if I could reach the, the very top levels of the environmental business and affect the top level, especially on a policy basis, I could have the biggest influence in my life. And um, and all the expeditions, all the nonprofits, all the work I'd done before, honestly, I never talked about it to anyone, but it was a means to an end to do this final legacy. And, I, and the, the legacy I had, I had the vision in 1980 when I, you know, gave my school away, had to, you know, start doing expeditions. At that time, I knew what I really wanted to do and then uh, it really started to come alive when during the Antarctic expedition. Uh, all of a sudden, I was working with, you know, like from Ely, Minnesota. I was starting to work with world leaders, advising world leaders, actually. But I was in that level. But when I crossed Antarctica for 222 days, the, the challenge to, for the six of us is what do you do with your mind for that long period of time? You know, there's plenty of danger at the beginning, but a lot of it is just day after day on the pl high plateau, you know, 130 days of nothing, uh, same horizon. Uh, you travel 10 hour days, 10 days straight, a day off, 10 more days, day off, on and on and on and on. But what I did with my mind was 
I start designing this vision that I had, this built, I designed it into a building. And uh, I was able, and I didn't, this didn't pop out of my mind. I had a six inch ruler and I start working with the basic foundation and working up. This came to me right at, at the end of the expedition is when I'm, you know, I culminated where I did the six inch ruler that I did the four sides of it. I pretty much kept how I saw it. I've actually built it that way. But having that space of nothingness in your mind and being able to design a building, live in the building. And I did, designed it in such a way it was five stories and each door story, or each floor was like three modules. So I could kind of keep that dimension in my mind and I could live in each room, each window, like I would watch the sun in the summer rise in the winter, the shadows in the, in the winter night, the moon, everything. So I, I designed that at that time. And then I came back and I started building. And I never, for the first 20 years, I never really told anyone what I was doing. People often wonder what was going on up here. This is the end product, you know, a year ago or so. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll talk about the completion of this uh, at the end here. Uh, my model, the only model I had, and, and I did do you know, a lot of models and I looked, I did, I did my business research, but Camp David was the only model I could find. Uh, camp David is, of course, the camp where, uh, well, I'll show you here some pictures. It's where, it's in the, not in the wilderness, but it's real, it's in the mountains. It's an hour away from the, from Washington, D.C., but it's where the presidents went to convene for major policy, major work, major, you know, treaties that affected the world. And that was the model I saw, exactly what goes on here. And I've designed it for 12 people. But here you can see you're, nobody has all the answers here. You're trying to figure it out. You, you have the best minds together and, and you're, you're closed the door, lock the gate and you have privacy and you work this thing out. And uh, in the success, you know, the, the Ohio Accord here. And this also showed me that, hey, look, people are saying, no, you can't do this. You have to have a golf course. You have to have a, you know, you, you, you do have to have a decent place for people. But here, it's rustic. I mean, the fact that, and both these men were assassinated, by the way, by their own people, unfortunately. And um, this is Nixon. You also have to have a place where you're making big decisions, where you can have total privacy, to be alone, especially in the wilderness, to make those critical decisions that might not be popular decisions or whatever. And that's that was my model. And uh, and the model was very clear. I, I knew it was hard to articulate this to people. And uh, fortunately for the first 20 years, I didn't have to articulate anything. All I had to do, but, I, but the building of it, I knew there'd be two problems, two challenges. One was the big building part of it. Where would the money come from? Well, I made all the money myself. Um, I had opportunities. Uh, I designed clothing. I gave lectures. I wrote books. Um, you know, I did my photography sold. So I put in about 200,000, 225,000 a year in addition to building everything and doing, I, my making a living was almost a sideline to me. And I put, you know, everything I had, I never had into, into this. And I slowly started building. And this was not a, you know, I couldn't build this in one year. It's like the, it's like cathedral building that went on for generations and generations. When they built the early cathedrals, they had no idea how they were going to make the arch roof on that because that technology didn't exist at that time, but they went ahead and built it. And that's kind of how this whole thing, you know, I, I just stuck to it. And it's, it's been the biggest challenge in my life. I mean, there, there was about 15 years where it was hard to walk inside this building. It was just overwhelming, overwhelming, but I kept the momentum every year. I never lost momentum because I knew if I lost momentum, even for a year, I might not get it back again. So I kept it up and then, I started building and uh, and uh, I felt the the challenge of this architecturally because uh, uh, this building is completing competing completing a competing against you know wilderness boundary waters critical wilderness I mean how are you going to build a building especially a tall building 
that's not going to look like a Disneyland. Uh, how do you do something that's architecturally beautiful? That to me, architectural ar architecture is about uh, expressing the beauty of nature or the beauty of the surrounding nature. So this gave me a, a, a whole huge opportunity to design. I, I'm a designer among anything. Uh, I just, designing is my, you know, it's really was what I'm about, visionary designing, but enabled me to do some incredible challenges. Uh, and then all this work was done by not just myself. I hired people in, back in the day here in the 1990s. I hired the people that were masters in their fields. They were upper 40s, 50s, mostly men at that time. Most of the majority of the people I work with now, the masters are now women. But back in that time, that you know, that wasn't a, how it was. Uh, but the but these were these were people that were at the top of their trades. I did have some master women working, electricians and so forth. But but these were people that were at the top of their trade, but they wanted to do one big project. So how it was worked, I worked it on the old master apprentice. So I would hire the master stonemason, and then I would build work a, a course around that. I would teach the, the art of stone masonry, mainly as a craft and also as a, you know, as a livelihood. Some people just want to learn to do a, a trade or, or woodworking. Some it's an art, it's craft. But uh, uh, what I do a lot is what's important to me is, is building the economy, which was all about uh, clean energy economy, was about building this workforce, which we now have. I'm you know, building stonemasons, but so the whole uh, center was built around that master apprentice. So it was a teaching, you know, it really has good karma that way that people were learning as this was building because just to build it was not enough to me. It was a teaching method all the way through. And, um, and you know, and, and it's done, uh, you know, I didn't do the lead certify. I don't believe in any certification. I, I, uh, I mean, I think lead certification is really good in most cases, but uh, but when you're certified, you you have to jump through a lot of ho ho hoops in order to get your certification. That I'm too independent for that uh, uh, because I, I I if I had to do hoops through some certification here, a lot of this would be just I would have to do something just to do it, and it didn't have any functional course. The main function to me. This is way before anything lead in the 70s and 80s. My main goal in this building was to be super, super efficient because energy is costly and uh, it's maintenance, it's everything else. So the bottom line was always uh, conservation and longevity. Something built of stone around the foundation. This is the third floor. Uh, the first floor of the building is the main conference room. The third floor is the dining uh, we hang out, very informal. Because when you're working with groups, you do a lot of formal, you know, the formal thing is very important. And the formal, you might have hard discussions and disagreements, but in that realm, you, you, the doors are closed and you've got to figure it out. And there's a lot of, but you got to let, let a lot of steam loose, but it's the informal part. Of, it's all about relationship building. It's the informal, leaning over the deck, looking at the stars at night as a group. That's where the relations and where the decisions are made. That's building that relationship um, and a lot of stone. Uh, and uh, we did, we've been doing stone for 17 years now. I did sto uh, stone building courses that were six, they were six weeks long and we had up to a dozen people working. It was like, you know, it was like the wall of China or something, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people working. And these are the floors, you know, fourth floor breakout session. Uh, this is the top floor, five floor, fourth, the fifth floor. I mean, this is an area where you're you're at in the evening watching the stars rise and northern lights. Uh, to be in that type of inspiration uh, is really to me is you want to be a point. Put it this way, I wanted to build an environment in the uh, with the community. A community is very important. Anyone that's been at the center realizes the, the summer community, but but uh, build the architecture, build a center in the wilderness 
where it's most likely where I call it lightning strikes, where you have that inspiration as a group, where you get to places where, where you can't do as an individual, where lightning strikes. And I wanted to build this center where it was most likely for that. And for me, it was um, also the opportunity to design. I, this was an opportunity for myself to do my own tile work uh, and to learn about tile work. And uh, with the online ordering of tiles, you know, you can order from third world countries. And again, it's it's a it's it's a great economy where you have access to a world of tile that you never had before. And that tile, you're employing people when you buy it. And I have some of the, uh, Ludlow is a master of tiles. He's 67, he's been doing it since he's 20s. So he is my, is the main guy. Again, he teaches his art and, uh, and the art of laying tile is just incredible. And what you learn through that, this is the, you know, goes from paper to the reality here. Um, and then all of, our, all of our wood is, our wood, our construction wood comes from our nearby forests, maybe off the land, it might be blow down or 20 miles away from the local lo lo logger. We don't go to Menards and buy dimensional wood that's been shipped all over. And we cut it ourselves on a, our own little bandsaw mill. I, I hire that out. I hire it from the local logger. So what we're spending our costs is hiring that logger. We're hiring the guy, the Bell, bandsaw mill, you cut, you cut maybe four or 5,000 board feet in a day, maybe five gallons of gas. And that with that dimensional wood, you, you, uh, you're, you, you're using solar power to make it into buildings or you're making furniture, that's all solar. So the, you know, the carbon footprint to that is just like nothing. And, uh, and any money you're investing goes right into the economy. This year is recycled. Uh, back in the day when um, I was early on into recycling, uh, I used to get the, uh, I got a, had a great older person that was recycling way before it was a, you know, it was a fad or anything, you know, 40 years ago. He took me under his wings and he, he was a professional in Chicago. So he got me, I used to buy about the truckload, but so all of our furniture wood was this wood that you couldn't, you couldn't afford it, but you couldn't environmentally justify owning redwood, cypress, walnut, uh, mahogany, uh, all this wood that it's just incredible, but it's secondhand wood. And there, this is the bandsaw, we would cut it in the bandsaw. And then in our shops, we do stained glass with wood. Uh, it's, it's an art in itself, and I'm teaching this art to other artists. Uh, those have been at the expedition. It, it's really, a, it's a paradigm of stained glass. Uh, I always wanted to do stained glass, but I couldn't get past the lead and the, you know, the solder and all that, it's just, but I, I figured it out about f uh, 10 years ago, a system using routers. I do really fine, fine uh, woodwork with routers, real precision. So I, I worked out a, set, a system where I could, I could, you know, make the cames where you put the glass, where it used to be the lead, I can make the cames out of wood. So we do stained glass and then the solar. Uh, and some of you in the audience were involved with our microgrid. This was. 2014, uh, and uh, oh, uh, John Kramer was a real uh, sundial. He was uh, Craig Tar also. Th those two guys were with me from the very beginning. Uh, they helped me get set up. I mean, I, so many people in the industry. This is his small crew. John, John's uh, John's crew was like your big family. I mean, that's, that's how a lot of these smaller organizations got started. And we we're very proud of the 2014, and then. Um, Jim Sullivan, who's a master of stonemason, uh, his brother, Tim, uh, older brother, both of these guys have been doing stone. They come from a long line of uh, 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 Irish stonemasons, and his daughter has done a lot of work, and their son-in-law does the work. And this is how we do it, it's teaching here, one one to one, whoops, sorry, the building. This is Aurora uh, Wallstrom, uh, she learned the trade, and now she's teaching the trade to conservation court. Now she's a real uh, ace uh, stonemason. I mean, she gets almost hundred bucks an hour. She's so 29 years old. I mean, she has a, a number of trades that she's learned at the center and she, you know, she does that. She's a arborist, you know, she makes 75 an hour, hundred an hour and that. She learned those trades at the center, but uh, this was the opportunity. And I, by the way, I, I've worked with women for the last 50 years on my school, all my expeditions, 
uh, most of my organizations, uh, all my executive directors were women. Um, I mean, I did women's courses 55 years ago. Uh, I mean, that, that was very natural to me. It wasn't a fad or anything. I, I jumped on 10 or 20 years ago. I mean, I, uh, I saw everybody as equal. And I worked also across racial Native, Native Americans. And, and I work a lot with uh, Summit Academy, which has been a great opportunity to me. Uh, uh, and uh, Summit, I've been working with Summit for uh, over 12 years. And uh, Summit's on the north side. They teach what one of the things that they do is a 20 week course where they learn uh, uh, construction. I've got to walk over here for a second and plug my computer in. One second here. Uh, I don't want to die out here in the middle. Um, almost to the end here. And then uh, Summit here. And, and Summit is, um, uh, it's inner city. Uh, it's, it's, it's about job, training people into jobs. Uh, they have about 80% graduate because you, it's a tough course to get through. It's free. If you don't make it through, you can redo it again the next year. But uh, about 95% of their graduates are placed in $25 an hour jobs in the, in the trades, construction. And at that level, if you want to work into, in, into the, uh, the trades, uh, the trades, uh, uh, the unions, or build your own business, you know, it's a free, uh, it's a free opportunity. And, and uh, I saw the opportunity of, of not only the clean energy move, uh, uh, movement, it's, it's the, how do we solve the climate project uh, uh, catastrophe was to me was all about economics and what it was about to me was it was going to be the opportunity but we never had of bringing people out of top poverty because you have to bring poverty people out of poverty uh how you need jobs you need jobs that are going to be there 20 30 40 years from now and that's the jobs that we now have and we can't find enough labor and training train people for them uh this is and we do the skills uh, fine wood working inside. Um, this was a youth at risk project that we did in the Cambridge area. This is a different type of population. Uh, uh, the rural kids, uh, you know, it's really tough, rural kids. I mean, they, at least in the city, you've got programs and that, but rural kids are really isolated. And kids that are uh, at risk in, in, in the rural areas are generally, they don't have a license because uh, they can't afford it or they screwed up and they took the license away. And so we used to... Uh, do a, a, a one month program. Uh, uh, it was a state state program, and we worked, you know, a month. It was it was a bit of a boot camp. It was it was really great, though. It was good. We worked hard, really good good results. Uh, we learned learned a lot from that program. Uh, we did a lot of international work uh, early on. This this is in Norway. Uh, we went, you know, with the climate. We were working more in in Europe in that direction. Uh, this is 20, 2012 or so. Um, and this is our climate gen, really proud here. Uh, our early, earliest climate activists, of course, you look at the population here, we're all women except for one guy. And all these, all these uh, individual people here now, you know, they're, they're in their 30s now, and they're all doing incredible work, incredible leaders. Uh, it's just, I'm really proud of uh, everybody here. Dunwoody, I taught four years at Dunwoody Architecture. Uh, which was a real opportunity for me. And uh, I was able to, with them, to work uh, on schematic designs as I build out, as I build out the center into future lodging and that. I was able, to, through the students here, to do schematic designs. And also to look ahead, what does this place look like 20 years from now? I did all that early work, you know, starting in 2017. Uh, a lot of that work I needed when I rezoned it and for, government use as you're building out. Uh, so, and, and it was a great, great opportunity. I think this is my last picture. Um, I'd make just one, uh, uh, let me see here. I, I wanna keep the computer plugged in not that I'll get all the shadows. Um, I mentioned there was two challenges. Uh, the one challenge is how do you get raised the money to do the building? And uh, that's a huge challenge in, in itself. And uh, and again, I, over the years, I. I look for centers and people that have tried centers. And there's many people that didn't have much money that tried, that failed. And I knew billionaires that had all the money in the world. They built the center, but nobody came. The question is, how do you, how do you get people to come? 
That's that's the question. And the question I have was a real clear question to me 35 years ago. I knew that. And, um, and I felt that I started, my career was in uh, activism and so forth, uh, was a bit on its head. It was different. I, you know, I, I started from a person in the woods for 20, 25 years living that way. And all of a sudden I was catapulted into the national, international stage, working with advising rural leaders, if you can believe that. And then I went back to home in 2002 when I moved back, I moved down to the city to work in on our local climate. And, and for myself, what my my commitment always is local Minnesota. I our culture is so important to me, and and I believe so much in the people and and uh, in issues like we have in Minneapolis. Uh, I feel that you know, as a, as a state, as a city, we can overcome these issues, and and we will because of a, the caliber of their people. Uh, in this state. So my commitment is to the state, but I needed to, you know, national, national, international recognition really helps uh, in building this out. So uh, my goal now is I'm in the city, uh, the center, I've been working 10 years on the center. It's a long process starting a nonprofit as maybe a few of you might know. Uh, the first seven years of purgatory of a nonprofit is really hard because you never have the money and you're struggling to define who you are. And gradually, you know, you have to look underneath each stone. And then gradually through hard work, you know, things actually start coming together. So right now, uh, I have a uh, projection, a, a four-year projection uh, and a budget and, and goals for each year. So basically the center itself, uh, I'll start programming in the, the summer, summer of 25, which a year from this summer. And uh, I'm, I'm calling the, the larger building here, the leadership center, the five-story leadership center. At that time, we may not be able to house, we may not have the facilities to uh, properly house people. So the first 25 and 26, those years of 2025, 20, 26, we can house you know, people that need the flush toilets and so forth and an Ely Grand Ely Lodge uh, in there, but we're gonna start our first pilots, which, are, which is really critical. And I have a number of opportunities. Uh, I'm not going to have too much trouble filling it, but, but those will be my first pilots in 2026. And then 27, we will have a facilities, uh, a simple facilities to house people. So now we can house people in like little individual units with plumbing, and we can, we'll have enough for 12 people. So starting in 20, 20, 27 and 28, we'll be able to we'll be self-contained and then uh, the full build out where we're able to, you know, house national and international leaders, you have to have really good housing for that, very expensive housing. You know, those, that's in the millions of dollars. But in 2029, 20, 29 and 30, uh, by 30, I'll have the entire center done and up and running. So we'll have national and international leaders there. So that's the time, time, time frame I'm running on. Uh, I now have it's always money. I mean, I'm always, uh, it's so difficult because I mean, I'm, I'm used to this. This is, uh, I can't say it's nothing because you're always in that present mode uh, because, okay, you're making, you're raising a little more money, but you're, you're building out. You have to build that. Now this year I have to get certain, I have to have that structure ready by, by 2025. This year I have to invest 150,000 into this building. I have a summer program. I have administration that I have to start hiring. I have to do that, and I have to raise that. And I, you know, and I'll somehow I'll do it this year. It's that year. Every year is like that year when you're expanding. And uh, I'm a risk taker to a degree, uh, but you know, uh, but you have to have a good vision and you have to be really practical. I mean, uh, I, the fact that I'm 79 and still living is a you know, I'm amaze myself sometimes I'm still here for what I've done and seen and, and been through. But, uh, you know, I don't take crazy risks. And, uh, and I calculated it, not calculated, calculated. Uh, but I, I have a really practical, consistent vision, and the ability to bring people together and being part of that community myself is very important. But 
Doug, why don't we, uh, why don't I turn it over here and then we can run the clock down. Uh oh. Are you on? Yeah, Will, we're good. Uh, did you hear me? Did it, did it go through? I think yeah. so. Okay, good. I wasn't talking to myself there on the. <laughs> okay, good. I was worried about that. What time do we have? Uh, we're we're about at, at uh, stop time, and okay, so uh, if uh, we got time for a couple questions, if anybody wants to raise their hand or just unmute themselves. Oh. Um, it's Chris. Hi. Um, just take well, it. There's actually a lot of questions, but one, one is, um, those first 12 people that you're thinking about maybe bringing together, um, what, who do you think they might be towards what, what system size be? Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah. The question is 12 people. Yeah. I mean, what, what are the first, what's your strategy for like building building the the community at this center so, yeah that's a good question together. what are those first 12 people yeah. need to do for you yeah that's it first you got to realize that you you don't just put this together and people come right away i mean you have to you use it, it's a process mm -hmm. so the, my ultimate goal is to work with higher level leaders of 12. you know we can do larger conferences too but when you're have 12, you have this ability to interact. If you add more than that, you lose your interaction. So this type of work where you really, like the Camp David work, you really have to uh, lower the numbers. And, and I'm talking about bringing leaders together, not develop, not leadership development, but leaders. Leaders are, uh, um, so with a leader, you have expectations of a certain maturity and so forth. So you're not, so you're at a higher level with leaders. And then the goal there would be to solve problems. Um, it might be, uh, okay, what is the effect of intelli artificial intelligence in our classroom, in our whatever it might be, or it might be water, whatever it is, or might be a certain policy that you're working on. So I mean, ultimately, that is what I, I want to go. But to, for myself, in order to, to build that uh, out, I'm Starting, I'm, I'm, I, I have a couple of leadership, already higher leadership, uh, local in Minnesota coming up in 25, but what I'm mostly doing to start with is I'm starting to do leadership development because uh, that's a new field for me. I mean, I, I know what leadership is, but I never, I never facilitated it and, and so forth. So I feel I have, and leadership development is a different different thing and it's an audience that I'm, I have real easy access. Like I, I may have like Marvin Windows, for example, I think is coming up and there I have access and there, there are eight main executives, their president. And there we, you know, we work all around a certain, you know, leadership development. But, but, but what I'm saying in short here, you, you have to build up to that, but the ultimate is really to bring, bring the leaders together. But um, I don't think I'm going to have any trouble. Like in 05 already, I almost have a full house of, I have, you know, it's great to have a choice, yeah. uh, but in, uh, 25, I mean, in two years from now, but we don't have the full facilities there yet. So it, that that's limiting and the building won't be, you know, you won't have insulation hanging from the ceiling, but the building won't be totally completed, but that is the expectations early on the first couple of years when people come. Yeah. Well, I think we got time for at least one more question and then, uh, we're going to have to break away for the MRES board meeting. A anybody, final question? Yeah, I have a question, if I could. This is Dave Ring. Go ahead, Dave. Okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, I would really appreciate uh, finding out from you going forward, how is it that we as individuals or as an organization such as ours, MRES, how can we be of assistance to you in furthering your mission? You know, uh, uh, several things. One, one is uh, the microgrid that we are going to develop. I mean, the microgrid that we have now is, you know, it looks for an average person, it looks large, but it's actually really tiny. 
But once we get this full facilities online, uh, it's going to be very complicated. In fact, not not all the technology is even there yet. But but um, but the microgrid will be, is going to be complicated but very important. Um, I'm hoping to maybe get the renewable energy. I, I work with um, Brian Allen from All Energy Solar. He's on my board, so he's he's my kind of conduit right now. And uh, but I I would see building out this microgrid. I would really like to have more access to that, you know, people to develop it. But we want to also build an educational program around that microgrid. Uh, because when uh, the technology and everything, we, we're on Star, Starlink. So, you know, the, finally the, the the satellite satellite is there. So you can broadcast anything out. You have full, like you do in the city. But you, you'll be able to monitor this whole system live from around the world. You have that access. And I, I feel that what we're doing there and what, we're, what the microgrid will be, uh, it's different than a microgrid down here because up in Ely, it's a it's a totally different environment, super cold, uh, and long di you know, snow, everything else. Uh, so that's a challenge in itself. But the microgrid, if you look at you go, if you take a look at the globe and the, and the, you know, the climate of Ely, and you go around the globe, that is a huge percentage of of population. So that area in itself. Uh, Alaska and all the way that that's a new area to you know to try things out but but particularly the educational side is what I I'd be interested in working with you with that's how we could do uh, through our microgrid and what education you have because it's um, uh, and you know get get this not only just in schools but also in trade so I, I would see the educational opportunity is what I the technical would be interesting but the educational opportunity down the future and um, and, and we're going to have a regular, like, uh, you know, our, our challenge there is we can't have, uh, because it's wilderness and that, you can't have a ton of people up there all the time, but you can do a lot of things remotely. So we'll have that capacity. I think, I think one thing that I hope happens is thanks to Ellie's help, we'll get this recording posted and then we will share it with a number of organizations. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, a lot of people that are on email lists for MRES, but we're all, I've already been talking to CERTS and to Fresh Energy, and they're very interested in, in hearing what Will had to say tonight. And so if we can, I think, get more exposure for him, um, the resources that he needs, I think, will, will flow toward him. Uh, that's my thinking anyway, so... Will, I, I hate to say this, but I think we've got to go. And uh, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful journey uh, uh, through your life and legacy there. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to, you know, there, there's nothing saying we can't have another talk uh, later on this year or something if you're up to it. So uh, th thank you again for your time and uh, a great presentation. Really, really, really interesting. Thank you, Doug, for everything you've done for all of us, too, and putting, making this possible. So, And hello to Pat out there, too. And with that, I think uh, we'll ask Ellie to just uh, close out the meeting, and, and us MRES folks will get on to the board meeting. And uh, anyone interested uh, in volunteering with MRES, we're always open to that, especially when we got great friends like Will Steger. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming, Will. It was just a wonderful story from start to finish. Thank you. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Will. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, talk Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Ellie. We'll see you uh, on the other side. <laughs> All right. Bye.